good to get you on. <clears throat> I really, really wanted to chat to you because you're, you know, you and I have known each other for quite a long time now, and your understanding of the complexities of the juxtaposition between macro politics and the plumbing is unparalleled. You know, you're very well known as the insider's insider. And I just thought with so much going on, you were the person I really wanted to reach out to, to just get a really an understanding of what is really going on and where do we think this is all going? And just to get your personal opinions on some of this. Well, it's very good to see you, old boy. And I thank you very much for having me on. And I'm very grateful to you and your subscribers for their time. And before we get into markets, Rail, I'd just like to give, as our American friends would say, the most enormous shout out to anybody and everybody who's been affected by COVID-19. Uh, our thoughts go out to families who may have loved ones in hospital or have lost loved ones. Our thoughts, of course, go out to all the heroes on the front line of medicine working in ICUs nonstop. And also our thoughts, of course, go out to individuals who are trying to keep their family portfolios on an even keel. And of course, all those small businessmen and businesswomen who are imagining what the next six to nine months or 12 months looks like for their business. So it's a very humbling time for us all, isn't it? I think that was a very generous introduction. Uh, I appreciate well, it. I'm just give, not sure it's deserved. Well, yeah. give people a bit of background about yourself as well, sure. just so they can catch up. You know, I, won't, I won't take your subscribers through my whole lamentable sell-side career. I should be grateful for that. But things got pretty interesting for me in uh, 2002 when I started working for a company called AIG. And I was in the trading arm of that. And then it got taken over by Jake, Joe Cassano and AIG Financial Products. And, and one might say that after for the four years after that, I had a front row seat at the circus. And I thought I knew a tiny bit about economics and markets. And then I became an employee of AIG Financial Products, and I realized there was a whole financial universe out there about which I knew absolutely nothing. And the irony, perhaps tragedy, of AIG Financial Products is that while it was obviously opaque to the rest of the world, internally it was transparent. And I was able to walk 10 feet, maybe 15 feet, across the dealing room in Curzon Street in Mayfair, which you obviously know so well, that building, right? Yeah, of course. And, yes. And, uh, and ask people, you know, what are you doing with this uh, subprime CDO? What are you insuring? Talk to me about collateral, balance sheets, and everything else. And I managed to stay out of trouble there for a period of time, uh, left to join UBS in August 2006, worked with some fantastic people there, Raoul, and some of whom you know. And UBS... I'll be ever grateful to them, let me loose on their client base and policymakers around the world. So I was sitting on a foreign exchange sales desk, but basically doing everything. And that was a very interesting time because from August 2006 onwards, I was trying to say to people, here's this thing called subprime. Here's what happens if house prices flatline, let alone go down. Here's structured credit. Here's what's under the plumbing of the financial system. And if A, B and C happen, we're in for a torrid time. And then through the 2007 and 2008, I got to work with some fascinating people. I got to work with all sorts of institutional investors around the world. And I was very, very lucky, firstly, to have a job during that period when many of our friends were being laid off and, and work with these people, but also help people not lose money, which was critical, and help some people who you and I know well make a fortune. And on the back of all of that, my client said in early 2009, you don't need a bank, go work for yourself, we'll back you. And as you may recall, back in 04, working for yourself is one of the most terrifying things you'll do. But happily, 11 and a half years on with the, with the backing of some fantastically loyal clients around the world, I'm still here, still plugging away. And Raul, just to finish, I'm still trying to be less wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's all we try and do. Oh. So, so talk me through the situation we're in now from your top-down perspective. We'll just we'll dig in as we go, just to see what comes out that's interesting. Yeah, let's let's think about the the, the highest level. We have a double supply shock. We have the obvious disruption, which let's not forget has barely begun from COVID nineteen, combined with this oil dispute, which we'll get into, I assume, later, between Putin and Prince MBS. We also have on top of that a nascent demand shock, 
because everyone's going into hibernation and hunkering down and not spending or consuming. And the last thing you want to throw on top of all of that is a financial crisis. Hence the extraordinary uh, actions that central banks are taking all around the world to prevent the financial system crumbling upon itself. So just to be clear, double supply shock, obviously the economic jolt from COVID-19, combined with the oil fight, throw on the other side of that a nascent demand shock as we all hunker down. And the number one priority of central bankers everywhere is to ensure that the financial system as best they can determine remains on an even keel and does not crumble on itself. Now, talking of the financial system, clearly a lot of what they're doing, I mean, there's an alphabet soup of stuff of which nobody understands, but it feels like they're, tr- they're papering over a load of cracks. They're trying to get the system working at its, you know, because, I mean, I've never seen the Treasury market really fail as much as it did. It kind of got itself in quite a bit of a mess. What do you think the current problems are and how are they addressing them? Yeah, you know, it's kind of like LTCM meets October 1987 inside 48 hours. That's, that's what it looked like in the Treasury market. But at the most basic level, you cannot hope to have a functioning financial system if there are no functioning risk-free curves for people to price assets or hedge assets. And that's why last September, if we go one step back, was so important, right? And people went on and on about the repo conniption and about Fed reserves and all these kind of things, which was broadly correct, but not specifically correct. The events of last September were a tremendous wake-up call for anyone doing RV fixed income, because we almost lost the bond market. I mean, let's think about a very simple example to help subscribers think about what actually happened in March in the Treasury market. Now, we won't go into the precise reasons, but for most of the past five years, Raoul, there's been a very nice little basis trade available to RV fixed income managers. And you go long treasury cash bonds and you sell the equivalent number of futures against them. It's a positive carry trade, or at least was, let's say for simplicity, around seven basis points. And you would lever that to the hill. And that requires, obviously, a lot of Treasury repo to be available to go along the bond. And it also requires a lot of liquidity in Treasury futures. But most of all, it assumes that your cost of financing is predictable and stable, which, Mm -hmm. of course, for about 48 hours last September, it was not. And we narrowly avoided last September a very substantial, nasty unwinding of all sorts of Treasury basis positions. um, And we live to fight another day. Fast forward to March, who would have imagined that the Fed cutting 50 basis points out of the blue, their first cut, would have been the event that derailed all these relative value positions in the Treasury market? Because without getting too technical, if GC repo rates, or let's just say repo rates are sticky and the Fed cuts out of the blue by 50 basis points, then obviously overnight index swaps and other short-term measures of dollar, dollar borrowing come down a lot. And that, ironically, is what blew up a lot of these RV fixed income trades. That spilled over into the Treasury market, just to finish the point, at a time when, let's just call him a principled man, was trying to unwind his risk unparity position or risk disparity. And it all just fed on itself, throw a sprinkling of foreign reserve sellers of Treasuries. And is it any wonder that constrained primary dealers and others found it very, very difficult to price and distribute liquidity around the world's ultimate risk-free curve, which promulgated the most astonishing intervention from the Fed, which is ongoing. And you recall many years ago, we all would have been blown away by the Fed buying 60 to 80 billion of treasuries a month. Well, they've been doing 50 billion to 80 billion a day, and it's barely keeping the bond market on an even keel. So look, what have we had? And this basic, let's not forget, Ralph, This applies to so many things we've seen over the past two months. It's not just treasury basis trades. It's not just credit. We went into this exogenous shock with everything priced for perfection, right? Mm. We'd had 10 years of leverage upon leverage, roll down carry, short volatility, illiquidity in duration, all boxed up on itself. We came into 2020 and all these heroes were saying cash is trash at precisely the wrong moment. And of course, you cannot hope to unwind 
10 years of cumulative risk and leverage and everything else in about two months. But suffice to say, we have removed an enormous layer of excess over the past couple of months. And the very best news for the financial system is thanks to these extraordinary central bank actions, we once again have a basically functioning financial system and we have basically functioning risk-free curves and a treasury curve. But I very much doubt any central bank is going to be able to step out of this for a long time to come. Is part of the issue here is that the kind of free market regulation of the treasury market switched from banks to private counterparties who don't get direct access to Fed liquidity. And therefore, there's a link in the chain, which is what blew up essentially was their access to the same price capital as the banks would get. Yes, that's a, that's one way of thinking about it for sure. There were a number of smaller broker dealers that emerged over the past several years uh, who did nothing but repo. And obviously, it's been a difficult time for those fellows, and I, and I feel sorry for them. I would say at best, those folks were marginal players and marginal providers of liquidity. Uh, a lot of the repo provision was still by the primary dealers, and, and we've all looked at the data or examined the data on JP Morgan and to a lesser degree, Wells Fargo, and we can see who had the biggest reserve deposits at the New York Fed. So we can imagine who the top players were. And I just say, Raoul, that it was still pretty much the banks we know, the famous household names that were providing the repo liquidity. But I suspect your question is thinking through the chain or following the money trail. It's one thing for JP Morgan's broker dealer to finance treasury positions and provide financing to their hedge fund customers and others. It's another thing altogether to downstream dollar repo liquidity around the world or through Japanese banks. And, and I'm taking a couple of steps ahead here, but bear with me. When I think about dollar liquidity choke points in the system and where things get stuck and where repo sometimes doesn't work or gets congested, I think first and foremost of the Japanese banks. And I think if I remember correctly, you've written a bit or talked a bit about Japanese banks and how important dollar liquidity is to both sides of their balance sheets. Yeah. So when I think about the past month, the critical thing was ensuring that the Japanese financial system, more so than any other financial system, had an adequate stock of dollar financing, whether it be secured or unsecured, to tide their financial system over. So to me, I, I'm spending a lot of time looking at Japanese banks and thinking about their ability to upstream and downstream dollars around the world. So we've talked a bit about the Fed here. What about, and again, we, we'll get into the fiscal stuff in due course, but talk to me through what the others, the other central banks, the BOJ, um, the ECB, the PBOC, you know, who's doing what here and what effects is it having? And then I want to come back and talk to you a little bit about why bond yields aren't lower yet. Good points. Let's start with the relatively easy one. The PBOC, compared to their global peers, has done nothing. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, right? Here's this event that is going to be disruptive for some time to come, which you'd think in the context of the shock to the Chinese economy, the People's Bank of China would be doing something like they did in 08 or 16, and related to which you'd expect that the CCP would be stimulating as, as on the extent, same extent that they did in 08 and 16, but it hasn't yeah. happened. No. It's, it's odd. And, and maybe there's some constraints there. And to be clear, I don't mean the balance sheet constraints. I don't mean dollar borrowings by Chinese corporations, although we can get into that. I'm thinking more the political narrative that Xi Jinping has created since 2017, which is this obsession, this persistent obsession with a deleveraging campaign to try to make the Chinese financial system fit for purpose. That still seems to be the dominant theme, which is remarkable. So the PBOC is a bit of a mystery to me. I don't think they're boxed in by the renminbi or, or the dollar borrowing by Chinese corporates, but I am surprised they're not doing a heck of a lot more. I mean, we know they're going to stimulate, but it seems quite limited and very gradual. Moving across the, uh, the, the Sea of Japan, I mean, the Bank of Japan's all in, every which way, because they have to be, right? 
They have to speak. So they just keep going. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, they have to. And I think my my rule of thumb is that they will be buying every Japanese ETF at least until the Nikkei has regained twenty thousand, and that could require an awful lot of effort. And the JGB market. I mean, it's it, look. I think we've had this chat before, right? It's to call JGBs a market is to give markets everywhere a bad name. The JGB market is just two numbers on the screen that are completely meaningless, right? But fair play to the Bank of Japan because they are very savvy when it comes to monitoring the liquidity of their banks. And you may recall in 2016 that there were some pretty nasty spillovers of the QQE, as they call it, the Bank of Japan was doing. And you got some pretty nasty tightness in the dollar funding markets, which caused some strains for Japanese banks. And uh, a former deputy governor of the Bank of Japan called Mikaso created a unique facility that enabled the Japanese banks not to tap the Fed, of course, because that's always been there, but rail to use their JGBs to pledge against dollar funding from the Bank of Japan. And the reason I flagged that, and I know it sounds a bit complicated, is the Japanese authorities have ample uh, ample ability to liquefy their financial system in dollars and yen, but they would be hopeful that the problem goes away. So the executive summary of Bank of Japan is muddle through more of the same and things seem to be improving for them. Why does the Topics Bank Index look so shit then? I mean, it basically looks like the European banks. I get what you're saying, but I just look at the chart and it says uh, something's not right still. Here's an example of what's not right. Over the past several years, the People's Bank of China and other lenders of dollars have taken advantage of the dislocation in the infamous yen dollar cross-currency basis. And as we know, for most of the past several years, there has been a premium for dollars And if I have surplus dollars, I'd lend them via the yen dollar cross-currency basis. I'd lend them, to, for example, to a Mizuho. I convert it into yen. I buy a Japanese T-bill, which gives me a synthetic US T-bill with a yield pickup, right? That trade's been going on for years. So the People's Bank of China and others supply the dollars to the Japanese banks. Let's stick with Mizuho. Mizuho turns around and re-lends those dollars or reinvests them in, guess what, US credit, right? And five or six years ago, the treasury teams of Japanese banks would re-lend those dollars into investment grade credit. Well, hang on, let's take more risk. Let's extend duration. Let's end up in high yield. Let's add some currency overlay on top of that, say Brazilian real, just to spice things up. Job done. So what happens if the People's Bank of China withdraws the dollars that they've lent Mizuho? Well, that whole daisy chain unwinds. And for the past couple of years, if you look at the chart of Mizuho and overlay US high yield spreads at an index level, it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. And I think that makes perfect sense. So I wonder, Raoul, if the Japanese banks would appear to be adequately funded. I'm not worried about that. But unfortunately, they have taken a lot of their dollars, it would seem, and invested in some very risky stuff at the wrong point of the cycle, and they have been punished for that. Right, okay. And particularly if we start to see some downgrades of these triple Bs, and if they're in the junk bond sector, there is, I mean, I think, you know, we could see a a trillion dollars of triple Bs get downgraded, and the junk bond sector is a trillion dollars. That's Even right. if my numbers are wrong by 50%, it's still impossible for the junk bond market to trade that. There will be a uh, there will be patches of indigestion, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so the ECB. So we've already seen, obviously, Australia and New Zealand now QE. Right. ECB, that's the big unknown because there seems to be – this is where we start to move into the world of juxtaposition between politics, fiscal, mm. monetary – Talk me through what you're thinking about that, and then and then I want to come back to bond yields again, as we said. Sure, sure. Well, the ECB, if we thought July 2012 was whatever it takes, this is whatever it takes cubed. And to think that Madame Lagarde 
with one loose sentence, undid nine years of Draghi when she said, unforgivably, my job is to not control spreads. That was quite courageous of her. She realised within five minutes how foolish that was. And ever since, the ECB has been in repair mode. And if we thought the summer of 2012 was whatever it takes, one would imagine, Raoul, that to avoid fragmentation risk, which is the great terror of European policymakers, as we know, to avoid fragmentation risk, the ECB is going to have to be the buyer of first resort of all these sovereign bonds, and Italy in particular. And there's a bit of a discussion around that I'm sure you've seen and your subscribers would have seen a lot of headlines. And again, last night, oh, the Dutch and the Germans are dead against euro bonds and joint and several liability and all this kind of stuff. OK, that's unfortunate. You would have thought there'd be a little bit of more political uh, solidarity right now across and within economic and monetary union. It's not happening. But you know what? I don't think it matters because the ECB has an open-ended balance sheet here, and I think they're going to need a lot of it. So they are buying and buying and buying. Their priority is to prevent a risk, a fragmentation premium in Italy in particular, for obvious reasons. I suspect they're going to be on the hook as the sovereign buyer of first resort for a long time to come because there is no alternative. I would recommend we all keep a very keen eye on BTPs, obviously. Um, I am somewhat concerned, to say the least, that despite extraordinary and persistent ECB buying role, you know, these BTP spreads keep leaking. And that's not a great sign, not a great sign at all. So the ECB, I assume, is a constant presence in all these sovereign curves for a long time to come. I shouldn't overlook the fact that they've given tremendous regulatory relief to Eurozone banks. To be clear, that does not mean a catalyst for any sustainable re-rating of European banks, but it does mean that they are free from balance sheet restrictions and via the ECB's financing facilities, they are getting enormously cheap funding at a cost of minus 75 to put into eligible collateral uh, of all sorts, which creates a positive carry trade for European banks. And again, that doesn't mean you own them, but the idea would be that that positive carry trade enables the best European banks to muddle through. And the final point, as much this also applies in the United States, the regulatory relief that we've seen in the United States, such as at long last so a, a, a one one year rain check or relief on the leverage ratio. It's not, as some people have said, to allow primary dealers in the United States to go hog wild on treasury repo and anything like that. It's to ensure that there's enough balance sheet capacity to lend to the real economy, which is obviously the critical thing here. It's about the real economy and ensuring that there's ample credit flowing to households and small businesses. And that's critical in the US as much as it is in Europe. So I just want to go back to the Treasury market right now, just because it's been interesting to me that you imagine that the Fed want to have yields as low as possible, mm -hmm. but they're kind of a bit sticky still. The, yeah. the market hasn't woken up to the game or there's something else going on. What, what, why is that? Why have bonds been kind of stagnant for the time being? Why, are they not, why is the whole curve not trading at zero? There's a lot of bonds to be sold, Ralph. <laughs> That's the Who's short answer. Who's selling them? The sovereigns? Well, there's some of that, and we can see it in the Fed's custody data. There's definitely been some liquidation of Treasury securities by, um, let's call them North Asian reserve managers, huh? Yeah. That's, that's, that's no surprise no. that the holdings would go down. But when I say there's a lot of bonds to be sold, I should have been more precise. I meant there's a lot of bonds to be issued a colossal amount of bonds to be issued, more than anyone can perhaps tally up yet, because we've got the CARES Act that went through Congress the other day, and that's going to require a lot of issuance. And now they're talking about, oh, well, the cost of borrowing is free. Let's, let's tag on another $2 trillion of infrastructure or whatever. There's no barrier to issuance. And I think quite a few people are, trying, are starting to or trying to tally up 
the amount of treasuries that will need to be issued or even bonds or BTPs or gilts or Australian government bonds to finance this, this bridge that all these governments are trying to provide through COVID-19. And I wonder if that is in the back of investors' minds in terms of, you know what, I know we're going through an economic emergency, perhaps an economic catastrophe. All in all, if the world's going into a sudden stop, Treasury yields ought to be perhaps a lot lower, given the disinflationary undertow. However, when I imagine the future supply, perhaps that ensures that yields don't fall too much yet. Now, of course, the flip side of that is that for macro financial reasons, it would be a disaster as we work our way through, or perhaps we've arrived at this very tenuous equilibrium, <laughs> if we dare call it that, in financial markets, where realised and implied volatility is coming down a bit in equities, which is no bad thing, somewhat similar in the better parts of the credit markets, giving everyone a time to sort of go take a deep breath and reflect on what their right exposures ought to be. The worst thing that could happen in this kind of mini time out here is that long-term nominal and real bond yields start to go up a lot. Yeah, I'm worried about the real bond yields. Exactly right. And the good news for the Fed, and by golly, it's taken a lot of buying, is that they have arrested what was a very nasty sell-off in tips, or should I say yields backing up a lot. And these days, Raul, even positive 10-year tips yields in the United States would probably be orthogonal to any hopes of a rapid rebound uh, out of this mess. But but how can you possibly – look, I don't know how big the deflation number's going to be in CPI and core CPI, which lags it, right? I have no idea how big it is. Is it 5%, 10%? I don't know. But it's going to be monstrous, even if it's 3%. Four. The problem is, is with bond yields at close to zero, you only get a tightening of financial conditions. Temporarily, you would think so. And at the highest level – that's not a bad way of thinking about it. But then I also have to calibrate this extraordinary support that the Fed and other central banks are providing. And then I need to calibrate it another step further because I think we're all aware that this is going to be a very, very difficult couple of quarters if we're lucky. I mean, this current quarter, every piece of data is going to look a little bit like the Great Depression. And I very much doubt anybody incorporated that in their bar models. Right? <laughs> Possibly uh, except, not. Except Renaissance technologies, right? Anyway, that's another conversation. That's why. <laughs> and we all know it's going to be hideous. If we're lucky, we get one quarter of data that feels like the Great Depression. And then, if we dare to imagine the third quarter, we get some kind of scrappy tentative recovery. Although it won't actually be a recovery for a lot of people, it'll feel like a really bad recession that comes after the Great Depression. Now, the reason I flag that is because there's no doubt we have this extraordinary disinflationary undertow for the current quarter. But as realised and implied volatility comes down, markets will start or dare to start looking through mm -hmm. and saying to themselves, OK, Near-term disinflationary risks are given versus, dare I say, medium-term inflationary risks as we attempt to restart the world in a heterogeneous fashion with bottlenecks everywhere. And whilst the unemployment rate will probably be ending up quite high for the foreseeable future, we may have an extraordinary situation in the third quarter-ish. I don't know yet. This is just a theory or a thesis. We may have an extraordinary situation in the third quarter where the unemployment rate remains high and firms are having to bid back for labour to get people into the labour force again to help them expand capacity and deal with the global economy spluttering back into life. So I, I hear what you're saying. I don't doubt that we're going to get some extraordinarily bizarre CPI prints through the middle of this. But I'm trying to imagine the second half of this year when the world starts to come back online. So temporary disinflation, a given. Structural reflation or sure. 
yeah. more inflationary. I think that's what we need to keep our eye on. And again, it comes back to the Fed. What, what's their trade-off? Well, they were told us. They told us going into this. Ironically, they were going to consider yield curve control and revising their inflation target and everything else. And by the way, what they're doing now looks awfully like yield curve control without actually targeting a particular rate because they're in the market every day. But they are going to be so cautious dialing back any of this liquidity provision as we move through the rest of 20 and into 2021. And the irony might be that the inflation that they've long desired might arrive in a meaningful way later this year, but they will remain on hold. And that's so, the long-winded answer to your question about yeah. between inflation and real yields and everything else. So going back a bit to the comments about the issuance of bonds. Yeah. So we know there's probably more to come from fiscal stimulus. Sure. Around the world, probably quite a lot, particularly, you know, when you go into, let's say, Q3, you know, things have dragged on a bit. You know, the economy's not there. We expect to start to see stuff. And certainly around the US election, we're going to start to hear a lot of noise. Now, I presume the central bank will be the bar of every bond issued. Yeah. And we start moving to the MMT style environment where basically the government balance sheet, as they're trying to repair everybody's balance sheet, you know, the households, the small businesses, to everybody else, the central bank has to step behind it. And that's globally the same central bank bid everywhere to try and allow governments to run massive deficits to do this. How's your thinking of that evolving? Implicit in your question is central banks everywhere, which to me means competition for global savings, right? So if we assume that any central bank anywhere is not going to be a backstop buyer of all these bonds to be issued, we assume that one or more private sector actors will find them decent value. And consider the case of the United States. I mean, yields are still positive a bit. They're certainly not zero. But there are no incentives, for example, for the fully hedged Japanese investor to buy any treasury to current prices, let alone structured credit. They just aren't. Unless, unless you get the dollar down a lot. So in yen terms, to use Japan as a, as a proxy for global pool of savings, the only way you entice private capital back into the treasury curve in a meaningful way that would enable the Fed, for example, to step back, I think is via a very substantial dollar depreciation, which we might talk about later on. So my why would it not be, sorry, just to, the other thing is why not the US pension system, which is massively underweight treasuries and has a a need for it because of the aging population. Well, that's what I thought. But one of the most extraordinary things of the past month is that you look at holdings of Treasury securities and holdings of strips have actually declined in March. Now, if I read the data correctly, it was $15 billion. Who cares? But obviously, these strip Treasuries have been very, very popular for US pension funds in particular managing their long-term liabilities. So I'm like, why on earth would US pension funds, assuming they're the biggest holders of these strip treasuries, why on earth would they be net sellers? What other exposures do they have that they got called away from? Because I don't think there's much redemption risk. So the broad answer to your question is, yes, of course, at a price, the US pension system will be a buyer. But then I need to calibrate that for capacity in terms of the amount of bonds to be sold. And of course, there are banks as well who would be happy to own treasury securities in their HQLA buffers. So, of course, there's, there are buyers of treasury securities around. But I still come out to myself and say, I, I very much doubt if the Fed's going to be backing away much from supporting the treasury market because they cannot afford to have any sustained rise in nominal and especially real yields. So I think they're kind of stuck. But there's this broader question about competition for global capital, right? There's, you know, Australian superannuation funds, are they going to be buying huge amounts of Aussie government bonds? Well, I guess so. How about Japanese investors? You know, what's the cost of hedging your FX risk into Aussie and stuff? And then you go around the world and you say, who's been the keenest buyer 
of Treasury securities, or certainly one of the biggest constituencies of Treasury ownership over the past several years, and unsurprisingly, it's the sovereign wealth guys, or more accurately, the reserve guys. And if for uh, reasons of downstreaming liquidity to their own financial systems, they're no longer a net buyer, but a net seller. You know, you keep coming back to the Fed, I'm afraid, being the only game in town. So we have a lot of unfinished business in government bond markets, I would be surprised if central banks have stepped back much, if at all, by the end of this summer. You may have seen yesterday the Reserve Bank of Australia articulated that they were intending to step back a tiny bit from the rate of bond purchases they've been conducting while still targeting three-year Aussie yields at 25 basis points. And perhaps it was another misunderstanding by markets, but even the merest hint that the Reserve Bank of Australia was stepping back from their uh, current run rate of bond purchases, saw a pretty nasty sell-off in Australian government bonds and the tenure in particular. And I think, Raoul, that's not a bad metaphor for thinking about how difficult it will be for the Fed to step back. And to finish this point, how impossible it is for the ECB to step back. So, okay, so then... I think that the fiscal stimulus side is going to be huge. And I, I'm interested in what you're picking up within Europe, because that's the one that interests me, because, you know, we talk about the dollar deval, and we'll come into that. But I also see the risk of Europe having to do certain things, which may put pressure on the euro for a period of time as well. I'm, you know, I, I think there's, a, in my mind, a phasing that comes from global weakness in currencies with the dollar going higher and then everybody having to do something about the dollar. Talk me through a bit about that and the relative, you know, what, what Europe's going to have to do here and maybe why Lagarde was actually brought in in the first place. Ah, there's, let's deal with Madame Lagarde. And there's this theory going around that Madame Lagarde was brought in there to take economic and monetary union to the brink and make euro bonds and more fiscal union inevitable to save it all. I, I doubt that. And I think she recently learned the hard way that it's a big step up from the IMF to being a central bank president when the markets are hanging on your every word. She won't make that mistake again. So that's the first point. I, I, don't, I wouldn't overinterpret the fact that Madame Lagarde is the president of the ECB. I'll just add quickly that she is ably served by some extraordinary staff running their balance sheet. I mean, as good as any people in the world, and they've been the ones who have rescued economic and monetary union for itself. But you're asking about fiscal. Look, I think the initial response in the Eurozone was loans as opposed to spending. Credit guarantees for Korean industries in Germany using KFW to provide a wrapper, if you will, for companies that couldn't borrow, all sorts of things like that. And I think, look, there's a lot been announced and done already, and it's all moving in the right direction. I, I don't know quite how to answer the question other than to say that the extraordinary change in fiscal attitude in Germany in particular is to be welcomed and encouraged. And look, a year ago, if Germany had said, you know what, debt to GDP, the debt break, everything else, we're letting it go, it doesn't matter anymore. Gosh, we would have all been betting on a very reflationary world, which is part of the irony here. It's like, oh, my gosh, the Germans have discovered fiscal policy. Hallelujah. Well, the fiscal policy that they're now deploying is barely offsetting the economic disruption from COVID-19, not just within Germany, but around the world, because obviously Germany is a leading manufacturer. So the way I think about fiscal policy, if I've understood your question correctly, is that it's going to be with us for a long time to come. All these so-called debt breaks and everything else in the Eurozone are obviously no longer relevant because they've been superseded. I hope, I hope that Germany in particular is not tempted to step back from this extraordinary response too soon. I hope they keep it going, as I do hope that every fiscal authority around the world overdoes it rather than underdoes it as we seek to navigate this economic disruption. But really, I come back to the ECB. The ECB is the fiscal backstop in the Eurozone, and just with the Fed. I suspect, Raoul, that many European politicians are quietly very pleased 
that the ECB is the getaway car, just as the Fed is expected to be the getaway car and the backstop of everything under the CARES Act. So, so really, go, go ahead. Do you, do you think there could be kind of a mass agreement amongst the European finance ministers to all say, right, we're all going to be allowed our own fiscal stimulus mm. of X, so we could all breach our yes. you know, agreements with Europe itself, we will do this, and the ECB will backstop it. I mean, that's kind of where I'm come from, that that kind of coordinated or semi-coordinated mass fiscal stimulus is something that Europe needs. I mean, there's no way Italy can get around it without it, or Spain, I mean, or even France now. It's so difficult unless they've got that backstop explicitly. I, I think they're well on the way towards that. And as we know from looking at the history of economic and monetary union, it has advanced over the decades one crisis at a time. And this is a big one because the whole project's at stake. The citizens' welfare is at stake. And as you would have seen in the headlines, there are any number of sneaky plans afoot to spring Germany and the Netherlands into agreeing joint and several liability by euro bonds. But to focus on one specific idea uh, that subscribers might like to dwell on, the European Stability Mechanism, or ESM, there are proposals afoot, which haven't been agreed upon, but they're proposals, to use the ESM and ramp up massively its borrowing and then to downstream that cheap borrowing, because it has a AAA rating, to all sorts of European sovereigns at the same spread. Now, that's very cheeky, isn't it? Because that is a backdoor euro bond without actually calling it as much. They're very cheeky, these people in Brussels, and they will never give up. So I would focus on this uh, emerging story that the uh, European Stability Mechanism, ESM, I think I've got the name, label correct. Let's just call it the ESM in case I'm wrong. That could be fired up in a large way to issue AAA paper in size at a spread compatible to Germany or maybe even inside it, and then to downstream that as a kind of central treasury to other sovereign states. It's very crafty. I take my hat off to them, but I'd recommend we keep an eye on that as a backdoor towards fiscal solidarity. I want to talk through the currency markets now, and then we'll move on to different scenarios and how this could play out because, you know, it's a very uncertain world. So, so talk to me through your phasing of the currency markets, how you see this play out. We all understand that the dollar is, it's a problem mm. for men. Um, how, how do you think this plays out? Well, it's the, it, we've seen to have inverted that famous anecdote from Secretary Connolly in the 1970s, right? Remember when Connolly was negotiating the end of Bretton Woods and he famously said, our dollar, your problem. Well, right now, it seems that the United States is saying, our dollar, our problem. We will be the world's central bank. We will downstream dollars at a fair price wherever they are needed in unlimited quantities to prevent the financial system tipping over on itself. Now, if you consider that, if you consider what the Fed's doing, and if you consider what we discussed earlier about the amount of Treasury issuance to come, you'd say to yourself, my gosh, you know, that's creating the conditions for a very weak dollar. Now, to be clear, I'm not overlooking all the dollar indigestion that we've seen over the past couple of months and which, broadly speaking, has calmed down a lot. So the plumbing is starting to work much better. It's not perfect, but it's much better. But the Fed is shoving money, shoving dollars out the door that seems to be working, but the dollar's not weakening. And here's where we need to get a little bit technical and down into the plumbing. But let's think about this scenario. The Fed is offering dollar liquidity to other central banks at a price of three month OIS plus about 25 basis points, which let's say for simplicity, 35 to 40 basis points all in. Now that's very cheap dollars and unsurprisingly, that has had a tremendous impact on a lot of dollar funding spreads around the world. So the cross-currency basis swaps, which have developed quite, uh, quite some fame over the past several years, there's now a discount for dollars as opposed to a premium. It's spectacular. 
But then the next step back, we have the Fed's commercial paper funding facility, which doesn't get up and running until April the 14th. The initial cost of this commercial paper funding facility, which need I remind subscribers, is a short-term unsecured loan, commercial paper. The original cost, I think advised by Mnuchin, which is, which is, was a ridiculous three-month OIS plus 220, which is stupid. They cut the cost to three-month OIS plus 110, which I'd still argue is stupid especially if, sorry, to be clear, it's not stupid. It's unnecessarily high, to be fair to them. And you have dollar liquidity going out the door via central banks at 35 or 40 basis points via the dollar swap lines. And you have a commercial paper funding facility at three-month OIS plus 110, 120 basis points when you factor in the fee. That's very, very high. But the problem here to think about exchange rates is that the cost of this commercial paper funding facility is acting as a kind of floor to dollar LIBOR. And the one price of dollar funding, if we want to think about it this way, that looks completely out of line on my screen is three-month dollar LIBOR, which continues to set, let's say simplistically, around 130, 135 basis points. And that's because I'd argue that the commercial paper funding facility hasn't started yet. Uh, the cost of it is too high. And we'll have a clearer picture on dollar funding conditions from April the 14th onwards. And you can tell where I'm going with this. Up until April the 14th, if dollar LIBOR is still fixing, three-month dollar LIBOR is still fixing at 130, 135 basis points, it's going to be very hard for the dollar to come down, right? So even though there's dollars going out the door and we're reliquifying the plumbing, you know, 135 basis points compared to negative numbers in some other jurisdictions, you know, the dollar's going to remain sticky. So I, I think after April the 14th, dollar LIBOR is going to ease off, maybe through May and June. And on balance, my suspicion is that may tend to undermine the dollar. I don't know yet, but I'm watching carefully. Because one of the things that still goes through my head you know, I'm, I'm still very much in the camp that the dollar goes much higher. Sure. Because, and my fear within this is that the swap lines are just an alleviation of a symptom. It's taking a headache tablet for the flu, right? Yeah. That's all it's doing. The actual problem is Chinese, South Korean, Indian, Brazilian, and a bunch of corporates yeah. have a lot of dollar debts. Now, the problem is, is in this world, as you know, it flows from the central bank to the banking system. So BOJ gets a bunch of these, or who, whichever central bank it is, yep. they give it to the banking system. The banking system utilizes what it can. And obviously, in a world like this, you kind of only give the dollars to the best credit. Yep. So it's a, it feels like a game of musical chairs where the worst creditors are trying to get their dollars, you know, trying to get, get the chair. And so I worry that there's a negative convexity in this market, that if the dollar goes up, it goes up a lot. Well, we certainly saw hints of that in the past month, didn't we? Because yeah, that was, that was scary for a minute. I've not seen that for a while. It was brutal. It was just this mad scramble for dollars because there was this absolute preference for cash, dollar cash. I mean, you know the world's in a bit of a bad spot when you can't even sell a T-bill or the bid offer spread on a T bill is like 10 basis points wide, which it was. I mean, that's just insane. So that added to the panic when corporate treasurers around the world said, Oh, I think I'll just, I think I'll just move out of my T bills into dollar cash. And it's like, you mean it's 10 basis point wide, and I'm actually hitting a negative. It's it was bizarre. Let's use a real anecdote here to help illustrate the point. Yes, there's been a tremendous amount of dollar borrowing around the world over the past several years. No surprise, because large-scale asset purchases in the United States in particular reduce the float of dollar securities. I mean, we know that. And I was um, in Beijing and Shanghai in February 2017. It was extraordinary, a very humbling experience, by the way, because you realise just, you just know nothing about China at all. You can read everything you like, but it's just, it's just unknowable, almost, almost. And I met some of the treasurers of the big Chinese policy banks. And it was a fascinating discussion about how they manage liquidity. 
And there's the onshore Remnimbi liquidity, which within uh, reason, within political reason, can be managed to increase yield. And then there's the gigantic dollar liquidity buffers that the biggest Chinese banks have offshore. And that's when I suddenly realized, wait a minute, who owns all the dollar paper issued by Chinese corporations? Where is the bulk of it? And the answer is tucked away in the treasury books of the biggest Chinese banks. Now, of course, there's a smattering of other dollar paper that falls into the hands of sophisticated mutual funds. You know, the Evergrande, probably a dreadful example, but Evergrande paper and other paper that some mutual fund holds, or mutual funds plural hold. But again, the key point here is that a lot of this dollar paper issued by wobbly Chinese corporates is tucked away in the dollar balance sheets of the big Chinese banks. And I would suggest that they're very interested in continuing to support the home team. I imagine it's extremely unlikely that they're a forced seller. And if things got immensely grim in China, I would imagine that the People's Bank would happily lend against dollar paper issued by the most critical Chinese borrowers. So why have I shared all that with you? Look, I've been as worried as the next person for a long time about the minimum amount of dollars, if one thinks about it that way, that the Chinese financial system re may require on any given day to remain on an even keel. But there's one little magic trick that I think people may have overlooked after August 2015. So yes, there were a lot of sales of Remnimbi $4 from August 2015 onwards. But the magic trick is that those dollars did not leave the Chinese financial system. They were redeposited with the Chinese banks. And that's one of the ironies of that episode. So the point I'm making here is like, yes, am I watching the price and the yield of Evergrande bonds in particular? Absolutely. Absolutely. Am I watching the cost of dollar high yield bond spreads from Asia high yield dollar bond spreads? Absolutely. But if you ask me to rank the issues that worry me now, I, I'd put that it might be in the top 10, maybe, but it's not there yet. I think the broad answer to your question about how hard is it to downstream dollars to the people that need them in emerging markets, I would say it's improving. It was remarkable to see yesterday that the Bank of Indonesia announced they too had created a dedicated $60 billion repo facility with the New York Fed. Well, that's remarkable. Now, I can't tell you with any certainty what difference that makes to the Indonesian financial system and Indonesian dollar borrowers, but the fact that Indonesia has that backstop, I would suspect does a lot for confidence across the Indonesian corporate sector. So really, I don't think we've answered, ultimately answered your question about how to ensure there's always adequate dollars flowing around. But there are, there are a few things being worked on, particularly the IMF, to create backstops, which might give everyone time to, to think and reflect. Um, because, you know, we've seen, um, so two questions. One is, one quick question is, there's been no dollar swaps with the PBOC, right? And there never will be. Okay. T talk to me about that. It's just not going to happen. Let's talk about this Fed's new repo facility that went into place last week, this FEMA repo facility. I'm sure subscribers have seen the announcement of that. And one report that's come back to me, I don't need to be careful here, but there's, I think it's true. SAFE, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange in Beijing, um, who manage China's reserves. There are a few more price-sensitive clients in the world, right? They will haggle over every basis point, whether it's an FX forward, a swap, spot execution, let alone a treasury purchase or sale or a bund or a BTP or whatever, okay? And there are reports coming back that during March, SAFE was an indiscriminate seller of treasuries and I'll just say other government bond markets around the world. 
highly unusual behaviour for such a price-sensitive market participant. Were they desperately short of dollars or were they trying to create mischief? And I think we should all reflect on that deeply. And I was struck by the way this New York Fed repo facility last week was announced. It's designed to help people liquefy their treasury securities, an overnight financing transaction to get dollars to their real economy. But it makes absolutely no sense at all, Raoul. Let's imagine you and I, the People's Bank of China are safe, and for whatever reason, we need more dollar cash in the system. So we pick up the phone to New York Fed and say, hey, look, we want to lend you 20 billion treasuries overnight. Well, hang on a second. I'm going to have to roll that every 24 hours. Do I get the dollars back again every 24 hours? It doesn't make any sense, even if you assume it's a term repo facility. I think this repo facility that the Fed has artfully created is to send a message to Beijing, don't you dare do that again. Don't you dare. If you want to go and hit a bid in the open market in treasuries and create mischief, we're on to you. Meanwhile, here's a facility that can actually act as an off-market purchase facility, in a sense, for your holdings of treasuries. Thanks very much for coming. So I think there's a lot more to it, and I would be surprised if the People's Bank of China were to receive a specific facility. This might be as good as it gets. And the last quick point on that is if I read the term sheet correctly, this FEMA repo facility or foreign reserve managers, right, imagine who, uh, comes at a cost of interest rate on excess reserves plus 25 basis points, something like that. So it's not cheap. It's not cheap. So I, I'm not holding out for China to get much love here. Do you think the Saudis and the Middle East uh, have to liquidate stuff as well? I kind of feel like it might have helped them a bit because well, obviously with the oil revenues imploding, they're going to need a bit of cash to maintain their system. If one reads the term sheet, there's nothing to stop uh, Riyadh using that facility as well to generate a few extra dollars. Um, I did think it was a tell. I don't know if you saw this. Was it last week or the week before where Ramco says, oh, we're thinking of selling a $10 billion pipeline? Well, hello. And I think this morning I caught the fact that the Saudis are doing a $10 billion bond issue. Well, what's going on here, right? Um, strange times in the kingdom, as always. Right. I want to look forward a bit because the market's got to have to grapple with a number of outcomes. Yep. One is, is the liquidation event finished? And none of us really know yet, but it's, you know, then there's probably, I think we both think there's probably a respite phase, whatever that is, whether that's a real recovery, huh? which is what you said. Then we get inflation issues. Maybe things change. We've got an enormous amount of stimulus coming through eventually, et cetera, particularly after the election in the US as well. What happens if growth remains negative year on year? and ongoing for a while. Because if I look at the psychological impact of what's happening, if I look what's happening in Hong Kong, which is now seeing a rise in cases again, if I see what Singapore's just done, the Singapore Prime Minister had a fabulous speech where he just said, listen, it's basically broken for a year or two, whether you like it or not, we're going to keep, we're never going to open our borders and we're yeah. going to be closing down the population from time to time. So all that says to me, all of this stuff and people's, the scarring of people's um, behaviours means that the trend rate of growth goes down significantly for a period of time, right? Yeah. So the question is, is how long that period of time is. I am focused on, I think if, if we go to three quarters of negative year-on-year -year growth, because mm. the Q, Q growth is going to be impossible now because of this, this last quarter. So let's say, so we're in it, we go from depression quarter to bad recession few quarters, Okay, which would be normal, right? Normally, in a recession, you kind of got 18 months of this stuff. Right. I fear an insolvency event. Ah. That's my biggest fear, and it's my highest probability that we have the largest insolvency event in history. That's what I'm looking at. And I know, again, neither, neither of us know. We don't have a clue. We're just trying to look at what the probabilities are out there. Talk to me about that. 
Well, thanks for such an easy question. I uh, let, Let's try and nut that out a bit in an effort to be less wrong. I yeah. mean, let's face it, if we get any of this half right, we're doing very well. So let's try and think about less wrong yeah. and what we know. Okay? Yeah. We know that we have a very tightly bound, complex system called the global economy that for decades has been optimised to a fault. Just-in-time inventory, just-in-time liquidity, just-in-time borrowings, just-in-time leverage, supply chains going every which way. It's a very complex system. And therefore, the, no the, the notion, not held by you, of course, but the notion that we can flick a switch and turn this complex system off and then reflate it in a quarter or two, I think is wishful thinking. Yeah. Because think about incentives. Pending the arrival of the small business loan or the PPP loan or the unemployment check in my account, which in the United States might in some unfortunate circumstances still take another month, what am I doing? I'm knuckling down. I'm hunkering down every which way. My consumption, other than of Netflix, is going to zero. I'm not buying anything. I'm not spending. And economy-wide and globally, that is a very bad outlook. And businesses everywhere are incentivized to fire employees first, ask questions, apply for loans later. And then imagine, to extrapolate this example, the dilemma for small business owners around the world. And we were talking about it a bit earlier. I, it, it, um, it's not terribly social for you and I to agree to go to a bar in which we have to stand 20 feet apart. I mean, no bar owner is going to open that one up and we're not going to turn up for a drink. And then the small, and then the restaurant, do we all have to have, you know, sit three tables apart? Why would any small businessman reopen if their revenues are going to be at best 50% of peak revenues? That's exactly my future, point. Which, which is your point. And the answer is, they may not do that. No matter how grand the government largesse, no matter how long the PP loans go for and everything else. Look, in the United States right now, I'm not sure about other jurisdictions, but in the United States in particular, we are not yet arresting the rise in jobless claims. We are not yet arresting the rise in unemployment. We are chasing it. Yes. And that's most unfortunate. But knowing that and observing that, if we're daring to sketch any kind of economic recovery in the world's most important economy, bearing in mind that the US consumer has been the world's consumer of first resort for decades, then we are penciling in not only a very patchy recovery for the United States, but a very patchy recovery for the global economy, because as we seek to move through this, the global economy will only be as strong as its weakest link, right? So where I come out, and we could go into more details, but for the sake of time, if we can muddle through this with some kind of L-shaped recovery for two or three quarters, I would take that because I think that would be a phenomenal outcome. Correct. Phenomenal outcome. I actually hope it's an L-shaped recovery. It's certainly the intent of fiscal authorities and monetary authorities around the world that we don't have an exact rerun of the Great Depression. I mean, it's remarkable, it's breathtaking, Raoul, that we have turned off the global economy. We've turned it off. Some estimates I've read have said there's a billion people at home right now just waiting for an employment check or waiting for the bailout. And the idea that you flick a switch and we all go back to work or we all take the Lexington Avenue Express, the four or five train, or we all rushed back to get on the tube. So here's, here's something interesting. So a couple of things. It's obviously China kind of asked people to go back to work, yeah. to go to factories. Well, because they can. That's another important point. We, we, we have command and control in China. Because that's so what nice. happens is, if you look at the TomTom -tom data for yeah. Shanghai, weekend traffic is still down 80%. So people go to work, but on the weekend, they don't go out because they don't want to. Yep. Um, also, they've now got factories building stuff. Right. To sell to who exactly? Well, that's, that's it. That's I mean, it. That's, this is why I worry about solvency, because yeah. Yeah. you've got this rolling issue of subdued demand. It's either catastrophic demand, as it is right now, 
But on and off, if you knock Brazil out of the global economy for a few months, you knock India out for a few... I mean, you've got this rolling destruction of demand. It, 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 that whole situation just really concerns me. Just to see that people... There is no normality. People don't go back to normal. It doesn't right. happen quickly. I mean, obviously, in due course. But supply chains, everybody's oh. going to have to change. I mean, the trade tariffs already started it. Yeah. And now... Every boardroom is going to have to say, can we allow for this weakness? That's it. And at a minimum, there will be a much increased preference for cash as opposed to just-in-time leverage, refinancing and everything else. There will be much increased preference for cash, as I think a lot of corporations are finding out, even in a a low-yield world. And we need to be very mindful, Raoul, that that does not become self-fulfilling because then... If every corporation around the world and every household around the world says, I prefer cash over every other asset, and to be clear, we are not there. We're not there yet. We may never get there. But that is your classic liquidity trap, which the authorities are doing their best to avoid. And in a liquidity trap, by definition, you have some very serious solvency problems because not many people can refinance at any price. And that's not good. But to be clear, look, we can guess various letters for an economic recovery and we can speculate endlessly on how difficult it is to restart this complex financial system, a complex system called the global economy. But that doesn't mean we should not be looking to invest. Mm -hmm. We have to keep an eye on some of the extraordinarily attractive assets that have been coughed up over the past month and may yet be copped up. To talk specifically about insolvencies, and you mentioned it earlier about high yield. And I think it's very interesting and important that the Fed has made no effort to backstop the riskier parts of the US credit markets. And it's not an accident. And if we think about the politics of what we're sketching out here, which is, I hate to say it, human misery and human tragedy, which hopefully we can work our way through. But the optics, the political optics of the Fed or frankly any other central bank bailing out the financial system yet again before money has arrived in the bank accounts of consumers and households and small businesses around the world, it's not a good look. And yet everyone tells me, oh, don't worry, the Fed's going to be on the hook for all the credit. They're going to buy high yield. They're going to do this. They're going to buy CLOs. You know, you go down the, the credit food chain, they're going to be the buyer. I'm not holding my breath. And they have been consistent. I know it's hard to divulge from what the Fed's been saying for several years. But if you read between the lines, they have been laying down a marker on commercial real estate, CMBS, leverage loans. They have, in conjunction with their peers around the world, been warning for five or six years about something you and I've chatted about, which is secondary market illiquidity in corporate bond markets. And to then do a handbrake turn and support every part of the credit market sub-investment grade would be setting them up as a political punching bag, especially if this unfortunate crisis drags out for more than one or two quarters. So why do they not do it via the municipal pension system. So why don't they just inject money into the pension? That, that's my theory, because like you, I think there's, it's impossible politically to go and buy the high yield market. But to say, well, the pension system, we need to make sure that they're solvent and you inject money into them, because they're basically funded by tax receipts at the moment. So there's no tax receipts. So the Fed can essentially, or the Treasury, I mean, the um, yeah, the Treasury or the Fed can, or the government, whichever mechanism, inject money into those with the, you can support the credit markets for us. I think you're asking me, what's the probability of a state bailout? And then what's the probability of a local bailout across the United States? Yeah. You you are seeing some minor improvement in the municipal bond market, which is no surprise because like so many risk assets over the past month, the enormity of the Fed and other central bank responses has injected this enormous amount of liquidity, which has reflated pretty much everything, right? 
just to give people time to regroup and think about what they own. And the municipal market has benefited to some extent. Rather than getting too involved in a direct bailout of state and local pension authorities, perhaps part of the idea of the CARES Act potentially is to create some kind of special purpose vehicle for state borrowers I don't know yet. But again, I come back to the point, I'm sure they've thought about it, and yet isn't it interesting that they haven't done it? So I don't have a, I don't have a great answer for you other than pointing out they haven't done it and there must be a reason for that. Maybe so, they're hoping that the liquidity eventually trickles down from some of their other programs and that there's an element of balance sheet capacity and arbitrage which brings parts of the muni market back into line. But, Raul, if you're asking me about a bailout for state pension funds, I, I'm not holding my breath. OK. Well, I mean, that's going to be a problem at some point. I guess oh, sure. it's not today's problem. Today we've had a liquidity event, not yeah. a broader, you know, but if this drags on, then we've got a pension crisis, you know, front and centre. So I just want to, because we've been chatting for a lot and there's a lot we've covered, which is fantastic. What I'd love to get, you, you talk about some opportunities. Sure. Where where are you th seeing the opportunities here? Because it's very difficult for most people to get their heads around what's shit and what is gold within this. <laughs> yeah, and there's and, yeah. And so you're, you're going through nuggets, and you have to know what you're doing. One way of thinking about it, for sure. But I, I think <laughs> there are, yeah, there are plenty of opportunities for patient capital. And to provide a metaphor, one consistent observation across all the largest pools of global capital who I advise is that they've all been nibbling in this sell-off. No one's trying to pick a bottom. No one's trying to predict a bottom. Why they're deploying capital into very specific assets and sectors based entirely on valuation. And I think that's important for all of us because we can read every COVID model we like. I don't think that's going to give us much insight into how to deploy capital. It might make us informed, but it's not going to tell us how to value a security that might be on sale at an enormous discount. So I think that metaphor of nibbling, and to be very precise, there is capital being deployed at the top of the US credit markets. So AAA CLOs. And just an anecdote, I know I keep saying just an anecdote, but I'm trying to make it tangible for your subscribers. There was a strange Bloomberg story last week, and I think it was ill-advised if true, that Citigroup had made $100 million by buying a AAA CLO tranche from Prudential Investments. Now, that's a very strange transaction because first, why would the PRU, of all people, given they're fully funded, need to sell a bulletproof, and they are bulletproof, AAA CLO tranche in the low 90 range? It doesn't make any sense. And yet Citigroup had the balance sheet to take the other side. And the reason I share that is because I think it reminds us how different this is to 2008. Because in 2008, it would have been Citigroup spraying stuff everywhere to the buy side. And now it's Citigroup that has the liquidity to allow the buy side to sell. And it tells you where a lot of this risk is held, hopefully in a sensible way. So there is capital being deployed, very specifically senior secured credit for those who have read their prospectus, AAA CLOs, but obviously, this money that's dribbling in to US credit up in the bulletproof tranches is not nearly enough to offset the potential supply and disruption to come, let alone offset anything people might need to distribute in high yield. Now, there's a very important technical point when we think about opportunity and solvency. On March the 24th, ICE BAML Indices said that they were going to take a rain check on rebalancing their credit and fixed income indices at the end of last month. Now, that's very interesting. And then the other index providers, including Bloomberg to a degree, followed on. And that actually gave the credit markets a lot of breathing room because if the rebalancings had gone ahead as planned, Raoul, there would have been a tremendous amount of liquidation in all sorts of credit, which the market would not have absorbed. And it would have been particularly problematic for the vanguards of this world and all of their passive bond funds. And they've postponed that to April 30th. And the point I'm flagging here is there will be plenty more opportunities in credit for the professional credit investor and the long-only credit investor 
because they're able to name their price and they're able to hold on rather than picking a bottom in all this other stuff. I mean, we could talk about credit in more detail afterwards, but I want to come back to equities as well. And I think we all need to be very careful here, especially now, uh, given the uncertainty, to try to stay within our circle of competence. And to be very frank with your subscribers, some of my friends would argue, I'd even argue whether energy more at the broadest level is within my circle of confidence, a competence. Although you and I know many very, very smart energy investors who have done phenomenally well in all sorts of market conditions. Now, let's think about numbers. Potentially over the next week, there may be some agreement between major energy producers that takes 10 million barrels a day of supply off market, perhaps by May. On the other hand, if you look at what Trafigura and other leading oil firms are saying, Demand reduction right now, as a result of the things we've been discussing in the energy markets, is running somewhere around 30 to 35 million barrels a day, a day. So if I take 10 million barrels of capacity off market, the frank answer is, so what? Why should we care? And if I go down another layer and I turn on the Bloomberg and I look at all these product and spread products and all down the energy food chain, it kind of roughly comes out with a market clearing price of oil, let's just call it broadly oil, somewhere in the low teens. So you think to yourself, uh oh, there's a lot more reckoning to come. It is, however, striking that in the context of that, which every oil professional knows, that some of the better shale and large cap energy stocks have stopped going down because eventually they discount the worst case scenario. And we need to sharpen our pencils here, but we're in the process of what you might call the shale reckoning or the shale restructuring that was postponed in 2016. And we're on the front edge of that. There will be consolidation. People will need to tie their balance sheets to the ground, but there will be winners. And at some point, despite this supply dispute, despite the demand destruction today, we will need the oil and we will need these companies, no matter as a sidebar, whatever people tell us about ESG. If we're going to restart the global economy, we need these companies and we need the shale companies in particular. So if I dare to think about what's not in the price, I look at what, again, to use that metaphor, our friends down in Texas, the really sharp guys are doing, and I say, okay, I'm watching what they're doing. I'm doing my own homework about the liquidity on the balance sheet and the funding and the hedging, of course, and the break-evens of some of these companies that I imagine might last. So it might be the Devon Energies, the EOGs, the WPX, you know, those sorts of things, Parsley Energy. And then, of course, I'm thinking about Chevron, Exxon, and Hess, and then I might be thinking about Woodside and Australia. It really depends. But the point is, I am very carefully, I don't trade, but I'm very carefully deploying some of my liquidity buffer, which I've had for a long time, into some of these companies. Equity, no, equity or bond? Equity. Equity. And I'm doing so knowing that the demand destruction is staring me in the face. Yeah. I do so knowing that I'm very likely to be punched in the face again if I miss the market, but I'm prepared to absorb that because I think myself there's long-term value in these particular and, companies. And do you think that the shale credit market has priced much of this in as well? I mean, look, it's not going to be com sure. completely correctly priced, but everyone kind of knows it's all going bankrupt and somewhere within that you're going to find some real gems, as, as exactly as you say, right. but... Do you think it's all priced in? Or do you think there's a bit more ugliness still to come? Put it this way, if I'm a shale producer and I couldn't refinance at the end of 2019, which was the greatest credit and liquidity bubble of all time, I'm dead. And I think it's QSIP by QSIP. Mr. Yeah. Market is identifying yeah. it company by company. There's a long way to go yet. You saw Whiting Petroleum, I think it was last week, basically tapped out. There will be others. But the ones that are left behind are the ones we need to keep an eye on. And a similar argument could be made for certain infrastructure companies if one's taking a long-term view. Now, I know what I'm describing so far is a little bit, uh, little bit boring and conservative, perhaps. 
But everyone goes on and on about Warren Buffett, especially now. Everyone's trotting out Warren Buffett cliches and finding out the hard way that it's all very well to talk like Warren Buffett. It's a very different matter to actually act like him when things go 50% off. But I would have thought, Raoul, that the ideal time to buy the metaphorical monopoly toll bridge is when there's no traffic. Yeah, and, yeah and, clearly. You know, I'm, I'm looking at things like Sydney Airport, which has never had this few flights. Well, certainly for six decades, has never had this, this few flights. Looking at their balance sheet. I'm looking at Ferrovial in Spain, which is a company with which you'd be familiar. Yeah. And I'm trying to evaluate their market capitalization versus their 25% stake in Heathrow, the LBJ Tollway in Dallas, and also the 407 around in Ontario. And they've got like uh, they've got a look on those assets until 2061 and 2076. So I'm pretty confident they're going to have future cash flow. So I'm just trying to think about, as best I can tell, the survivors, the money good assets. But I'm only dribbling money in because every analog for bear markets like this tells you in no uncertain terms that you revisit the low. Yeah, everyone has a. I, I wrote about this in GMI. I was like, look, all the smartest people I know are doing exactly what you're doing. And I say, one thing I do know is everybody will get stopped out once or have a gut check once. Yep. And then it usually works because it's always the people doing their homework who kind of figure out, OK, these things are now ridiculous pricing. And, you know, for whatever phase that is, whether that's ongoing or it's the next three months, whatever it is. So it's always interesting. I think you're right. Yeah. And I, it's very careful, very selective. And no doubt subscribers have different things on, on their radar that they understand. That's right. And it's not trying to be fancy. I mean, you and I use airports, or at least we used to, right? <laughs> but you still think yourself they've got a minimum amount of liquidity. Their net debt's yeah, low. That's a, great, that's a great idea. You that's know, great and just very gently and you know you that's can even great like, idea. the toll roads that have no tolls is a, is a really great idea a monopoly toll bridge with no tolls and and you know you can use that metaphor for a range of industries and sectors and and mr market is giving an opportunity for patient capital to have a look and those and, are and not those businesses are not reliant on growth they're just because they're not like you know, all services company, all services company to get back to the highs needs, you know, building tons more pipelines or whatever it is. But the toll roads just expect some return to normality. And before yeah. you know it, yeah, it's cash yeah. flow I mean, positive. Look, but believe me, it's not nearly as exciting as dear old Bitcoin or anything like that. But then again, nothing might be, you know. But, no. you know, for someone like me, just trying to be sensible, trying to lay out some capital, trying to imagine a year or more out what a healed world might look like. It's not sketching in growth. It's not trying to forecast growth. It's not trying to predict anything. It's just trying to say, okay, I am reasonably confident that we will need X, Y, and Z. We will need energy. We will need logistics and infrastructure. We will need uh, shale. You know, I could go down the list. And if Mr. Market is allowing me in, allowing me to have a small ownership stake in these assets at a discount to their replacement cost in what, and this is the cherry on top, might be for a while a more inflationary world. I have to think carefully and deeply about those assets and the opportunity, not because any of us have the ability to predict the bottom. In fact, if we wait for the bottom, it's too late. We have to think about it now. We have to think about how we feel if they all go another 10 or 20% off, which actually affords, you would hope, a larger margin of safety. We're not a seller at that point. We actually have to say, okay, I need more of it. So I'm just trying to imagine the world one or two years out that's looking a little better and what might be quite valuable. James, listen. I can't thank you enough. It's been an epic conversation. We've covered an enormous amount of ground and enormous amount of things. And you're exactly the right person for this because, you know, you're, as I said, your, your breadth and depth is very unique and rare. And I think to come out with some opportunities out of it as well. So it's not just a gloom and doom or listen, we don't know where it's going, but here's some concrete things people can think about. I think it's incredibly useful. So as ever, I'm ultra grateful. I'm grateful to you as well, mate, and well done for, for the success at Real Vision. I'm, I'm glad to 
finally, at long last, be a tiny, tiny sliver of it. Here I am. You were with Jim Grant before me. That was outrageous. I do apologise. I was actually tempted to wear that revolting sky blue jacket that I wore for that interview, but I thought your, your, your subscribers have seen enough of that. But look, just to, to, to send a message to you, your family and your subscribers, it's a very difficult time. There's no, pres no precedent, no easy precedent, no easy analogue. Our greatest uh, sympathy to all the families that have been directly and impact indirectly impacted by COVID-19. The most monumental shout out to the first responders and everyone in ICU and to the small business owner, husband, the wife, the person sitting at home trying to keep their portfolio on an even keel as an antidote to all the troubles immediately in front of us, and there's any number of them, try this. Draw up a list of the assets you've always wanted to own with a margin of safety and dare to dream that you might actually get a piece of them in the period immediately ahead, which will help you protect your capital for a long, long time to come. James, great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thanks for your time. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.